Hello and welcome to my thoughts on 100, 101, and 102. This is it. This is the end of season 10. This is the end of Friendship is Magic. I mean, I still have like seven other issues to go back to and get to, but I'll get to them. Oh my god, it's the end. So first off, issue 100, Elements of Love, which is actually like a doubler, so I'll be cutting it in half. I don't know where exactly, but where I left off right now is just after the Knights of Harmony giant lore drop, and right when Lyra and Sweetie Drops were doing their thing. So, Team Rainbow Dash arrives at the city of Ornithia, where it's full of all kinds of birds, but not parrots. The parrots live in the Parrot Peaks, and I guess they're like the lower class, and Solano's family are servants to the king and queen. So Solano calls them raptors, which at first I thought was just a derogatory term for the birds of prey. But apparently birds of prey are just very commonly called raptors. I've never referred to them as anything but birds of prey, so today I learned. And wow, the city just so happens to be preparing for a royal wedding. Solano seems to be strangely timid when interacting with the castle guard. Very unpirately of her. Perhaps it's related to why she left Ornithia in the first place and became a pirate. We shall see. And after Rainbow Dash forces their way inside the castle, there's the tree! Just there! Turns out the birds already know all about the elements of harmony in the trees, and we don't have to find it and activate it for them. Wow. And now it gets to the part where I want to kill myself, as I try to figure out how to pronounce ancient Greek. So as Solano, I put in very minimal effort. And I don't even know if I'm saying it right still. At least like how My Little Pony officially pronounces it. I found one clip on YouTube of the voice actress for Solano pronouncing it as Solano exactly one time. And like, good enough for me. And I mean, no one's told me I'm pronouncing it wrong otherwise, so... So I must be pronouncing it right, right? And I hear you saying, it's said in the movie at least one time. Well, I haven't seen the movie yet. And the few clips on YouTube I've searched up with Solano in them, her name's not pronounced, so who knows, not me. So anyway, the pronunciations I decided upon for our cast of new birds are Ilo, Zephyra, Ossipi, Thaumus, and Ozamin. And much like Solano, all of these characters are from Greek mythology. So Thaumus is an ocean god, and he, like, bangs some kind of water girl named Ozamin, more commonly known as Electra. And then she popped out three little harpy sisters named Ilo, Solano, and Ossipi. And Prince Ilo's wife, Zephyra, is the god Zephyrus, who had some baby horses with Ilo the harpy. But maybe it was Solano? No one knows for sure. What we do know is, Zephyrus definitely porked one of the harpy sisters. I wonder why they decided to gender bend Ilo and Zephyrus? I don't know. I don't think there's any plot relevance. I guess just for fun. Wikipedia doesn't really have anything specific on Ossipi or Solano, but what we do know is that the three Harpy sisters were chased down and almost executed by the Sons of the North Wind. But then their non-Harpy sister Iris came down and was like, Stop, or I will kill you in turn. And then the Harpies weren't killed the end. So, now that we've finished our history lesson, it's time to continue our fun little pony story. So, all the birds are really happy to see Solano, and then the Lady of the Hour Ossipi comes in and introduces her fiancé. Hugin, maybe? Who knows how to pronounce Ancient Norse, not me! So, quick little short history lesson. Hugin is one of Odin's ravens, and his ravens act as his eyes. That's all I will say. Why we're suddenly shuffling in Norse mythology? Who knows? But Prince Hugin hails from the Western Ravens. Which, if Ossipi is specifying Western Ravens, it must be important for some reason, so keep that in the back of your minds. And he is acting a little weird, which all the ponies agree with. I do think he is a spy of sorts, mostly because of his namesake. Like, why name him after Odin's ravens, who were tasked with watching over Midgard, if he wasn't here to watch over the birds, right? Seems like pretty basic logic. So I guess real quick before history lesson ends, Hugin is of the Western Ravens. But there is one more character who has a connection with West, Zephyra. Zephyrus is the god of the Western Winds. If Hugin is doing something shady, is there a chance Zephyra is also trying to do something shady with Ossipi's brother Ilo? I doubt it, because <laughs> her throne is lit up, so she must be part of the family. Just a thing I guess I should point out, but it's probably obsolete. 
So while Lyra and Sweetie Drops go check on Hugin, we get a huge exposition dump. Oh my god, the drought has turned into a hurricane, help! It's like five straight minutes of lore. I'm not gonna touch on this too much more, but oh my god, this pacing was so poorly planned. So much lore, as we know- Okay, so, Elements of Harmony. So every time I said it made no goddamn sense when any character was randomly assigned elements, it's because they weren't! They were different elements! They're not the elements of magic slash friendship that we know! I thought it was just bad writing, but oh my god, it was planned from the start! <laughs> this is so dumb. I mean, it's, it's not a dumb concept. It's dumb that every pony was like, Oh yeah, your obviously friendship, your loyalty, uh-huh, your honesty, yep. These all are perfectly valid traits and they make sense. Like, no, why didn't anyone just agree with me? None of the elements of science made sense. <laughs> why didn't they let a, why didn't they just foreshadow that they weren't the same elements? They could have done that so easily. On the bright side, this totally means that Moon is not magic. So just for clarification's sake, I will now be referring to our Elements of Harmony, Twilight's Elements of Harmony, as the Elements of Magic, and our Tree of Harmony will be the Tree of Magic from now on. So the birds have the Elements of Love, the cats have the Elements of Purpose. I don't know why they have Purpose and not Patriotism, considering their arc was about overthrowing the government, but whatever. Dogs have Family, which makes sense, no questions there, and Zakora has History, which which is basically just friendship. So we'll find out which elements of love each of these birds are. And an interesting thing to point out, none of the specific elements are called love, which is odd because the set is called love, which makes me think that our set will actually be called the elements of friendship. But for now, until it's clarified, I'm going to say magic. So this time around, I'm not going to play guessing games with the elements of love. I will, however, try to guess Solano's. Because, spoilers not spoilers, she will probably find her way into this love hexagon. Alright, so we got generosity, kindness, hope, protection, trust, and perseverance. And if I had to make an educated guess, Salado looks like a good match for the element of perseverance. I can't believe I just said someone was a good match for an element. What? There's a first time for everything! But I mean, if perseverance is already called for, then she's, she can fit protection too. Why not? So it's interesting that one of their elements is hope, and the first thing that comes to mind when hope is said is somnambula. And specifically what I'm thinking of is when Pinkie Pie tells all the pillars about the elements of harmony, the elements of magic, somnambula says they are a reflection of our own elements of hope, beauty, strength, sorcery, etc. She specifically says our elements of hope. So when they name drop the element of hope here, are they purposefully trying to make us think of the pillars? Or did they just pull a random word out their butt and it doesn't mean anything? I mean, honestly, it's hard to tell if it's intentional or not. But I mean, either way, I'm excited slash waiting to hear an explanation of is how this relates to the pillars. So I hope we get there soon. Quick art note, all of the temple lights are lit up, but apparently that's not supposed to be the case. The bird light is still supposed to be definitely off according to Ospi, so so I'll probably color them to be off. So I mean, I guess also art note, this Temple of Love is the only temple to have the little picture of the temple, like above the lights, to be different. All the other temples have all the exact same picture drawn, but this one is different. Why? For no reason, presumably, because lol, why would anything they do have reason? That's what I've come to expect. Still waiting on the hieroglyphs from the Desert Temple to mean anything. At least we've got some more hieroglyphs here, and they make me think that they're completely irrelevant. Except that guy's still here. That guy's still here. That guy can still be involved. Well, I guess speaking of pictures on the desert temple, that world with four trees suddenly has meaning to me yet again. So we have come to learn that Equestria's Tree of Magic does not have a light. It is not responsible for that lit light that's always been lit. That is actually the Knights of Harmony's light. Which with that knowledge brings me back to my original assertion that Equestria's Tree of Harmony is fake. And that's why there's that picture of the Earth with four trees on it. 
And you know what's cool about four trees? Nothing. <laughs> Well, that's not entirely true. Apparently, Mesoamerica does have one tree for each cardinal direction, which, I mean, that would coincide with a painting on the wall, but... But, I mean, there's not really any basis to start saying Mayans and Aztecs are in this story all of a sudden. So, obviously, the first thing that comes to mind with trees is Yggdrasil, the world tree, the Norse world tree, and, huh, suddenly, Norse has crept into the story with Hugin. What does this have to do with anything? I don't know, it's just an observation. Anyway, this temple has a picture of Discord on it. Huh, the desert temple had a picture of Cosmos on it. Important information? Who knows? So I keep looking at the depiction of the knights from the story Yasupi tells. They have bird beaks, but they also have serpentine bodies? I keep trying to put Hugin under that robe, but they just don't look like a raven at all. So it makes me think, ravens are a local plot thing, not an overarching plot thing. And while I can't attest for the apparent beaks, you know who else has a serpentine body? Discord. And along that line, Cosmos. You know who randomly appear on these walls? Discord and Cosmos. So what I'm thinking is, are the Knights of Harmony Discord level god beings? Cheerily defines Discord as a lack of harmony, so are Discord and Cosmos the opposite equals of the Knights? That's my running theory as of now. But then, uh-oh, all the lights in the temple started going off, and the Bird Queen thought they were being attacked. You know who attacked Equestria's tree? Discord. Just saying. Well, I guess it's been retconned to Cosmos, but you get the point. But like, also, according to Asapi, the knights seem pretty cool. But every time one of those lights flicks on at the end of a story, and that guy's like, Oh god, another light! Boss, let's call the Knights of Harmony! It seems pretty ominous. So are the knights bad? They seemed pretty chill until they went to look for that sixth bond, which is presumably our bond of friendship slash magic or whatever. So what did they discover? What happened to them? Because I'm just going to say, whatever happened to the knights when they went looking for that sixth bond probably directly correlates to Star Swirl. But also, Oseep says it's been here for more than a thousand years, probably a lot more, which would mean uh, Star Swirl's probably not directly involved. But if it isn't a lot more than a thousand years, and just a little more than a thousand years, Star Swirl can totally be directly involved. Because presumably, along with Twilight and the girls, the pillars represent that same sixth bond. And in that case where he is directly involved, the only thing I can think of that was bad happening around that time is, uh-oh, the big bag darkness that's taken over all these ponies and making them super evil. Could be related. Then again, probably not related, but it's a theory. A pony theory. Thanks for listening. Um, okay, with that, I'm, I'm going to end this part here, and I will see you when I finish the rest of this issue. Alright, I have finished 100, and now Lyra and Sweetie Drops are sneaking into Hugin's room. Maybe, but also Solano and, <laughs> Solano and Asapi are arguing. I hate that it's constantly flipping back and forth. I don't know why that was the choice that was made. I don't like it that much, and maybe I'll even swap some scenes around. Who knows what future me will do. Anyway, Hugin is talking to mysterious off-screen stranger, who reveals that Hugin's actually a crow, not a raven. Is Hugin even his real name? Who knows? But not like he didn't do his namesake justice. He was a plant for evil mysterious stranger all along! Whoa! I probably don't need to keep saying Mysterious Stranger, it's one of the Knights of Harmony. Very convenient that as soon as we get the Season 10 lore dump, the Season 10 plot starts happening. I really don't understand why... Oh, what's her name? What is her name? Um... Caradwin. I don't understand why Caradwin was hidden from us completely out of view while she was talking to Hugin. Since as soon as Lyra and Sweetie Drops report back to Rainbow Dash, they all collectively agree, yeah, it was the Knights of Harmony. He was talking to the Knights of Harmony. 
And then big surprise, it turns out to be yes, he is working with the Knights of Harmony. If they wanted the reader to think he was working with the Knights of Harmony, why keep it completely ambiguous from us? All that did was make me think, no, he's not working with the Knights of Harmony. They're misinterpreting the situation and it's going to be some other twist. But no, turns out it's exactly as they thought. No surprises here. <laughs> but I mean, hey, I guess they got me. Plot twist. It wasn't a twist. Ha ha ha. <laughs> and then BAM! She shoots Lyra and Sweetie Drops. Meanwhile, Solano and Ossipi are having a lover's quarrel. And yes, of course, Solano was the sixth element of love. No surprises there. And she is Perseverance? What? I had the information available to predict which element she was? Wow, what a concept. I wish Asapi had said what the elements of the other sets were called. I would like to know what Kaffir and Zakora's elements actually are, but oh well. She does not want Asapi to marry Hugin, because she can tell she doesn't love Hugin. Which I mean, if the whole point is to activate the elements of love, uh, kinda makes sense where Solano's coming from. Not that arranged marriages don't work, but in this specific case, Asapi is trying to force her destiny to come. But, uh, I don't think the elements work that way. But like, on a related tangent, her throne is already glowing. If her element is already active, shouldn't she know that she's in love with someone? Uh, like Solano does bring up, her whole family should be aware that she has already met and fallen in love with her pair, or however this, this element of love thing works. They probably could have scienced out who it was, but instead her dad's like, marry this random guy. And she totally agrees, yeah, this is the best strategy to activate that last element. But uh, anyway, Solano and Ossipi's fight. Much like Capper and Chummer, Solano and Ossipi's relationship is the B-plot of the story. With the exception of... We already had Capper and Chummer backstory. Uh, do we got nothing for these two? And, um, nothing is really explained. They just have little fights and then they love each other at the end. I, I don't know. <laughs> nothing, nothing happens with it. I don't understand why it wasn't uh, fleshed out a little more. It's literally just this one page that says anything about their relationship. Like, we don't know why Ossipi and Solano wanted to run away, and if it was Ossipi's idea, why did Solano even decide to do it without her? We truly do not know anything about Solano's relationship with any of the birds here, and the only thing we can do to supplement this story is fill it in with logical cliches. Thaumas probably didn't like his son and daughter getting so close to the help. And he probably either told this directly to Ilo Rossipi, or at least to his guards, to make sure Solano stayed away from them. Which could be why Solano says she was never going to fit in at the castle. And since Ilo and Ossipi both regard Solano as a very dear friend, Thaumas probably failed at keeping them separated. Solano also says she doesn't fit in at the Parrot Peaks, probably because she was born and raised in the castle. And since the parrots of the Peaks seem to be the lower class, they probably resent her and don't see her as equal to them. And after living in the state of not belonging anywhere for years, Solano wanted to leave Ornithia. But then Ossipi was like, what if we left together? We could take one of my father's airships. <laughs> but that could be how it goes, but who knows? And if Thaumas and Solano were, like, having problems with each other, like, <coughs> apparently he threatened to kill her if he took Ossipi. I would think that if there was a dispute like that between the elements, that they wouldn't be able to activate. But apparently it's all good here. So, in Zakora's arc, Zakora speaks directly to the Tree of History, and it tells her a bunch of generic things about how friendship is magic. And it specifically says, Any creature who wishes to use the elements of harmony must simply look to their friends. Which, I mean, up until now has made a lot of sense because uh, we just assume that they're the same elements as we have in Equestria and they're about friendship. And with the zebras and cats and dogs, it just so happens that they're friends. But with the birds, they are not friends. So it's weird that the Tree of History would say this when it's not applicable to this set of elements, because, I mean, Solano 
only knows two of them, and she hates one of them, Ossipi says that each temple is devoted to a specific bond. But what is the bond that connects the elements of love together? Because she only names the other four. The bond of family, the bond of shared experience, the bond of shared cause, and the bond of country. There is the obvious bond that all of the birds are technically family, through blood and or marriage. But this is not the bond of family, the dogs are the bond of family. So the Tree of Love is specifically about romantic love between three sets of birds. Does the Tree of Love only require each element to be bonded to one other element? It's so weird that this one seems to operate differently. Speaking of the bonds, the Knights of Harmony are the bond of country? Man, I can't wait to see how patriotic they are when they come to conquer Equestria. They better show how patriotic they are, otherwise, cause I mean, their lights lit up, they must still follow that bond of country. There better be a payoff for telling me that they're the bond of patriotism. Man. So other than, what is the bond of love called? What is the bond that Equestria has called? Because it can't just be friendship, because all of the trees are supposed to go off of friendship, right? If we're to leave the tree of history. Unless maybe the twist all along is that Equestria is the bond of patriotism. Ooh. And that's why the new Knights of Harmony hate Equestria, because they hijack their bond of patriotism. Oh my god. <laughs> anyway, Team Rainbow Dash is unconscious on the airship, and they're going down. Ooh, attempted murder. These Knights of Harmony mean business. But unfortunately, Solano wakes up and saves everyone. Gotta say, I did not think Solano could fly, but apparently she functions just like a squirrel. But then, uh-oh, they're going to be late for the wedding! So Rainbow Dash and Spitfire slingshot Solano there. I don't think that's how physics work, but who cares? Solano is just in time! She pulls out an emergency hat and cutlass and prepares to duel Hugin! But apparently Mama raised a bitch and he calls for the guards. Thankfully, Rainbow and Spitfire show up to take care of them. While Solano's giving a perseverance speech, Hugin pulls a Die Hard, oh my god! I've never actually seen Die Hard, but I sure as hell know a Die Hard when I see one. And then Solano touches the last throne and it glows blue. And suddenly, Ossipi realizes that she's been in love with Solano the entire time! Whoa! And then Solano defeats Hugin the end. But oh my god, it's not over because Caridwin appears and reveals her entire evil plot. The new Knights of Harmony want to burn Equestria to the ground for whatever it did to them. So, Caridwin's design. Yep, a very serpentine with a bird head, just like the temple depicted. She also has a heart on her chest. Could that mean that she is like, the guardian of the Temple of Love? Or do they all have hearts on their chest because all six bonds represent a different kind of love? Just to like, iterate on that point, when Ossipi is going over the names of the different bonds, something that immediately comes to my mind is something Cadence says to Tempest. Love is not restricted to romantic love between two ponies. It takes a number of forms. Love of family, love of friends, love of country, love of self. And um, not that I need to point out, but the five kinds of love Cadence talks about are almost exactly the same as the five bonds Ossipi talks about. I mean, there's love of self, and there's the bond of purpose. This is basically the same thing, right? <laughs> An argument definitely could be made, but everything else literally exactly the same. And yes, it could just be a coincidence these are two completely separate stories, but these two completely separate stories have the same writer, so maybe not coincidence, maybe just canon. Anyway, back to Caridwin's design. It looks very aztec -y to me. She is a brightly colored bird serpent sporting green, gold, and red feathers. Yet her name is Caridwin, and she's from Kunabula. <laughs> I'm getting mixed signals all over, there's too many cultures here! Caridwin is a Welsh name, also in reference to a Celtic goddess, who might also just be a sorceress to appease the Christians. And she also has shape-shifting powers, which our bird serpent does show off on Hugin, but she is from the island of Cunabula, which is Latin, which the Celts did not speak, and means cradle. And as far as I can tell, it's not a specific anything in any kind of mythologies? I couldn't find any references. It just means cradle. 
which that in of itself could be symbolic of creation of life and stuff, because like, you know, babies and whatnot. I don't know how all these pieces fit together at this point, it's very confusing. The Knights of Harmony are either Celtic, or Roman, or maybe some kind of Mesoamerican, Aztec, Maya stuff? Like I said earlier, Mesoamerica does have four directional world trees, with a fifth central world tree. They also have serpents that look like Caradwin, and those Mayans sure did love building temples. Although they were more pyramid-shaped and very steppy and didn't look like this. I mean, with Hugin not actually being a raven, that Norse connection falls through, and this Mayan-Aztec connection seems to be the most relevant, but then again doesn't seem to be very relevant at all. I know I'm doing a lot of thinking when I could simply just brain off read next story. I don't know, I like thinking. I don't really get to critically think a lot, so I mean, uh, it's nice. I mean, that's why I started doing these discussion videos like this. I wanted to critically think about how I thought the next issue would expand on the Season 10 overarching plot. Joke's on me for thinking most issues would have something to think about, though. But that's enough critical thinking for this issue. I got the next one to read and I could do a whole lot more critical thinking. So let's talk about this story. I like that we finally got plot. That's nice. But unfortunately... Solano's side plot was completely irrelevant. Like, Zakora story got a little shafted because they had to force in some plot setup, but that was the first part of the story. I mean, you know, it had to be done. But now, we're just about to hit the climax of Season 10, and they waited till the absolute last second to just force in a ton of extra exposition just so we knew what was going on. That's really bad planning. I do like how the season 10 plot is going so far. Not the pacing, of course, but the actual content. But man, if you just wanted to read this for a nice standalone Solano story, <laughs> you don't get one. It doesn't exist. And what's like crazy is that we got such a good payoff for a story we didn't get to see. I loved the entire wedding scene of Solano versus Hugin. Since Team Rainbow Dash arrived in Ornithia, Solano has been acting a little off. When they first arrive and all the other birds are staring at her, her response is, let's hurry up and get to the castle. And when they get there, yet again, she acts strangely when talking to the guards. She's ashamed to be a parrot in Ornithia. And then finally, when we get to the wedding, she shows the other birds who she really is. She's not just some lowly parrot. She is Captain Solano. She doesn't care what Hugin, or the guards, or the rest of the raptors think of her. She's here to kick ass and take names! Like, looking at the four main parts of Season 10 as standalone stories, this is by far the weakest one. And it's not even because the writing, or the setting, or the characters were bad. What we did have was good. We just didn't have a lot. Caninia was a very weak story, but at least it was a story. This one's just nothing. It's just exposition dump, so the next two issues, the finale, makes sense. Man, Solano got it way worse than Zakora did. Rip Solano. Also, we were too busy reading lore that we didn't have time for any fun moments. Lyra and Sweetie Drop sneaking around for, you know, that little bit was a little fun. The whole wedding scene, you know, where Solano crashes in, all Shrek style, I object! You know, and then fights Hugin. That was pretty fun. And that's all. Yeah, not a fun story, not a well paced story, just a story. But that being said, it got me excited to see how this finale goes. You know, maybe sometimes it is best to not reflect on the past and to simply move forward. Into issue 101, hell yeah! Oh wait, before I move on. So in issue 96, Capper, Rainbow Dash throws out a cock tease that Twilight's been reading about trees and ancient temples and stuff. But when we get to the end of this issue, she has literally nothing to report. She has found nothing. So what the hell was the point of that on the airship with Rainbow Dash and Pinkie Pie? Goddamn waste of time, that's what it was. Alright, issue 101, go! This is it. It's time. Everypony is heading to their emergency action plan stations. Also, Lyra's here. 
I didn't think she'd make it back for the attack. I mean, Rainbow was zooming home. I guess the knights took their sweet ass time getting to Canterlots. Anyway, after her stylish crash, Rainbow Dash is slightly injured, and Meadowbrook is treating her. And honestly, Applejack and Rarity in the background, kind of funny. You know what? Good touch. And then also, Commander Pinkie Pie reporting for duty. It just made sense in my head that there needed to be waffles. And I know there was just waffles in issue 96, and maybe that's why it was in my head, but it just sounded right to say the waffles are a go. And I thought it'd be funny to draw some waffles, and then every scene just have more and more waffles suddenly appear. And, uh, yeah, that's all I have to say about waffles. And then rumble, there's an earthquake of sorts. And then everyone's going outside, and it's like, this is creepy, and I'm not a big fan. I guess this minor rumble is just very unsettling. And then splash, all of the waffles are ruined, no. I don't know why Rainbow just assumes this is the knights using magic, but she's absolutely right, the knights are at their doorstep. So Twilight has a little talk with the leader of the knights, and his name is Danu. Much like Caradwin, Danu is a Celtic goddess of earthquakes. It's interesting that he's regarded as the leader, because Ossipi says that it's ruled by two families, not one particular of the group. Well, actually, maybe it totally makes sense, because Caradwin also says the king of Kunabula Center, and supposedly all of the Knights of Harmony should be princes and princesses, and not king, unless Danu has claimed that spot as his own. So he wants Twilight to hand over the elements, but he's a little too late, they done got broked. And Twilight says their power lives in her now, but I'm pretty sure it kind of always lived in her. But regardless, since they don't got no elements, they gotta die! It is pretty funny that he just dug under the forest field. And also, I thought Discord was helping with that barrier. <laughs> How did he let this happen? Discord, come on! Until Season 10 started, I never knew how much I needed Tempest and Rockhoof together. I think their interactions are my favorite part of season 10. I'm so glad I was right about them being friends. And now it's time for the big reveal. All of the knights take off their cloaks. And you recall how I was having some cultural confusion regarding the available information on the knights? Turns out that was very much intentional as they are all wearing clothing of various cultures. The only thing they seem to have in common, well, I mean, besides them all being chimeral creatures, is that their names are all Celtic gods and goddesses, or other Celtic mythological beings of sorts. So Danu, as I said earlier, um, is a Celtic goddess of earthquakes. And then we got Balor, who has a big poisonous eye, and if he looks at you, you die. <laughs> That's his lore. And next up is Tyrannus, who is the god of thunder and bad wind puns. Wow. Uh, then we have Octopus Girl. We don't get a name on Octopus Girl, at least not yet. And if there weren't so many different kinds of Celtic water goddesses, I would hypothesize a guess, but there's not a point. Who cares? And the last one up is Morrigan, aka the Morrigan. She has the power to inspire or demoralize soldiers. Very useful in this situation. Except, like, this Morgan, like, Sombra-style mind controls. <laughs> That's cool. So like I said earlier, they all seem to be representing various cultures. So while Danu is sporting a very classic Greco-Roman attire, the Morgan's just straight up wearing Native American headdress. While Balor has a kilt of sorts, so I'm guessing he's representing the Celts. And this could just be me being racist, but Octopus Girl is wearing some kind of headdress that I would think is of Hindu reference. While, like I said earlier, Caradwin is looking very coaddle to me. And then there's Tyrannus, who's just got some armor on. I'm not an armorsmith, so I can't be sure, but it looks pretty Germanic in origin to me. And when you combine all that with their chimeral forms, it's like some kind of symbolism. They're just the cultural melting pot of mythos. But anyway, the knights totally wreck all of the army. And meanwhile, Twilight's freaking out because she doesn't want to die. And then Spike's like, gee, I wonder if they'll target the kids too. And then, uh-oh, they already have the kids. 
the end. Honestly, not a lot happened, and you know what? I'm okay with that. Very concise, short, and sweet. The only real concern is, there's only one issue left, and I don't think they're gonna have time to meaningfully resolve this conflict that has just barely started. Like, I don't think this is gonna be worth the 10 issue buildup that we actually didn't have because they were too busy doing other things to develop the story, which is why we had to get a five minute lore dump at the very end. That being said, I'm still having a good time. A little disappointed that Tempest lost to a storm and Rockhoof lost to a rock, but hey, I'm excited to listen to the story Danu's gonna tell Twilight. So I assume it will be about the incident that happened in Equestria, and hopefully it... I don't know, I just want someone, Danu, Star Swirl, anyone, to talk about Equestria's tree. And how do I think Twilight's gonna win? Because obviously the characters don't die here. I don't think Twilight can talk Nojutsu her way out of this. The knights are pretty hell-bent on destroying the elements, because they, like, feel like they have to. I mean, this is their, this is their element of patriotism coming out, right? Bringing the elements of harmony to other lands nearly brought the downfall of their country, so in order to save it, they have to take it all back. But I mean, the real question is still, what happened in Equestria 1,000 some years ago that changed their philosophy? How did the ponies fuck everything up? But like, also, Danu kind of a dick? Tree of History over here saying, all any creature must do to use the elements of harmony is simply look to their friends. But then Danu just comes in like, I guess your pathetic little elements have some utility, but my element of loyalty is the best. I mean like, God, what an asshole. I don't think the Knights of Harmony are bound by friendship. On the contrast, the other elements kind of hype each other up a little bit. When Danu talks shit to Tyrannus for his sick wind puns, um, Octopus Girl's all like, I think his wind puns are pretty cool. And then when Caridwen sees Shining Armor about to fight Belor, she says to Big Mac, Oh, your friend over there's gonna get wrecked. And then Belor's like, This was pretty cool, but Morrigan's got some cooler magic. Honestly, I think it's just Danu. Like, Danu claiming the role as leader of the Knights of Harmony. I wonder if he is also the one Caridwen referred to as the king. Oh, cause like, yeah, Tyrannus and Belor refer to, refer to him as my liege. They're supposed to all be equals in this. The knights are supposed to be equally ruled by two families. All princes and princesses. We got this dick over here making himself king. Don't see any loyalty in that. Wait, was this whole season 10 just a secret friendship lesson in disguise so that the Knights of Harmony can be friends again? Oh my god. Can Twilight actually talk no jutsu her way out of this by teaching Danu the magic of friendship? I guess we'll find out next time on My Little Pony. Ding ding ding, it's next time. Okay, real quick, I just want to talk about Danu's story. I haven't finished the issue yet, I have only finished the story, but it has raised a red flag. And just gotta say, I'm very confused. So first things first, Danu's story confirms this is all multiple thousands of years ago. So yes, this predates the pillars, meaning that one day Star Swirl just accidentally tapped into their magic and created the Tree of Harmony and the Elements of Harmony, both of which were properly named using the proper terminology that the knights used, coincidentally. And it's weird because like, Danu says, Our ruler had given away too much power. So, Kundabula is specifically giving up their own power to make the other elements. So does Star Swirl just have the exact same magic as the Knights of Harmony? Very confused. And then the other thing I'm very confused about, he blames this on Discord. I gotta say, Discord is a tricksy little rascal, and you know what, I wouldn't put it past him for trying to manipulate them to have a little fun. But also I hear you saying, Discord's like a super bad guy, right? Not so much in the comics, no, because all of his prior bad acts were explained away with Cosmos. In this continuity, Discord did nothing wrong, but he took the blame for everything Cosmos did and altered everyone's memories. So the fact that Discord is inciting a war directly contradicts uh, what he says in Cosmos, you know how I feel about killing. 
I, that's, that's like the whole point of a war, right? So I don't think Discord actually started this. And of course, through the thoughts, could these be Cosmos's bad acts that Discord is being blamed for yet again? I mean, not really, because once again, this is multiple thousands of years ago. This is pre-Equestria shit. Cosmos was very much during Luna and Celestia's reign. That being said, maybe while Discord is just chilling around in pre-Equestria, Cosmos is around the other side of the world interfering with the dogs and the cats and the zebras long before she crashes on Discord's little planet. And then for whatever reason, the knights just assume this is all Discord's fault. Because you know, the guy's kind of a dick. I get it. And she keeps getting referenced in the art, so she's just fresh on my mind, of course. Like, it's gotta pay off, right? They're not just putting her- <laughs> They're not just adding her everywhere for no reason, right? Surely, it means something. <laughs> God, I know exactly how Rainbow Dash feels in this scene. But, uh, TLDR, I do think Danu is an unreliable narrator. He is extremely biased. <laughs> and <laughs> I love that he just reiterates how much of a douchebag he is. And most importantly, the element of loyalty. God, we get it. <laughs> Much like I referenced earlier, he specifically says the phrase, love of country, which ding ding ding, surprise, Cadence immediately pops up when she hears the word love. Is Cadence going to teach Danu a lesson about love? But anyway, hopefully everything gets a lot less confusing later. But for now, I'm going to go back to finishing the story. Okay. Okay, okay, I just, I just finished it. I just finished 102. So, you know, I didn't think there would be a meaningful resolution. After all, we didn't really have much time. <laughs> but I didn't think, but, you know, I expected there to be a <laughs> resolution or any, just Twilight, Twilight shot him and he ran away at the end. <laughs> Nothing happened. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I don't even know what to say. I'm... I'm just stunlocked. So Twilight and Danu had conflicting ideologies. And that is what has been fueling the conflict. But there wasn't an ideological resolution. There was a very swift physical resolution, which had almost nothing to do with what had been going on this entire time. This was so much more poorly planned that a guy could have even anticipated they didn't have a story they didn't they just didn't have a story they had no story all right all right all right those were my initial reactions but now i've had a good solid week to reflect on this so let's go back to the beginning of the story actually before i start 102 after that long hard week of reflection i just want to say i really really do like 101 i just want to point that out right now I think it just has very good pacing and characters, and truly did make me excited to see the finale. Alright, anyway, let's start 102. So, Danu's story. I already touched on this, but it's really, really weird. It's really weird. I don't understand why Discord's just here. It's not like there's any ponies around here for him to mess with. And then all of a sudden, he goes all the way to the zebras and the cats and the dogs. But not to the birds? Why didn't he get the birds in on this too? Why did he go all the way to Abyssinia, but not hit up Ornithia? It makes no sense. And yes, I did have the initial glancing thoughts. Well, Ornithia did hide themselves. But then again, if Discord wants to be somewhere, he can be there. <laughs> it doesn't matter if it's hidden or not. And also, they didn't even hide themselves until the other temple's lights started going out which is either because of Discord's meddling or because of the knights closing off the temples. But either way, there's really no excuse that he didn't send the birds as well. And also the birds, the birds, the birds! Why do the birds have a carving of Discord in their temple? If Discord didn't go to their temple, because he clearly didn't send the birds, and the knights didn't go to the temple. So who carved Discord on the birds' temple of love? And I have now completely lost all faith in the art to aid the storytelling. Because it's just all random. To dust devils and rainbow dashes in my dismay, nothing means anything. Oh, and before I just end Danu's story, I made some tweaks to the dialogue. Danu says Knights of Order and Knights of Harmony all over the place. 
and it's not consistent. Like, he says Knights of Order before they even- before he even explains that they changed their name to the Knights of Order, and then after that, they actually only say Knights of Harmony exclusively, and it's really weird, so I fixed them. You're welcome. Which brings me to question, why did random background voice say, Call a meeting of the Knights of Harmony, if they had changed their name to Knights of Order? I'm just gonna chalk that up to, the writer hadn't come up with that plot point yet. Danu also says, they're not at the whims of feelings, but I'm pretty sure if they stopped embracing their elements, their magic would probably wouldn't be as strong, right? Like if Morrigan lost her faith in their king, or if Waterboy didn't accept his command. That sounds like they're not being true to themselves. Unless, and something that has been shown several times, all of the other five elements were almost nothing like our own elements. Equestria's elements have a main element, the element of magic. Its is the culmination of the other five elements. The elements of generosity, honesty, laughter, kindness, and loyalty have to be brought together in order for the spark to create the sixth element. But none of these other elements seem to have a main one of the set. And I'm pretty sure Applejack or Rainbow Dash or Rarity can't just harness the magic of their elements by themselves. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure only Twilight can truly activate the elements of Harmony. Um, anyway, Twilight and Donnie get interrupted by Cadence, who does nothing for the plot, and Trixie, who does nothing for the plot, and Discord, who should do something for the plot, but does nothing for the plot. And these three just actually get in the way and cause a bunch of, um, hilarious hijinks. And then Twilight and Donnie go back to talking. <laughs> God, don't you love the beginning, the middle, and the end? Twilight and Danu talking, shenanigans, and then Twilight and Danu talking. <laughs> what a good story progression. I'm not trying to rag on it, it's just really funny. <laughs> what I will rag on, though, is this part where everyone splits up into teams and then lure the Knights of Harmony out one by one. All this segment does is make light of the threat. Caradwin gets one shot, Waterboy gets two shots, Morrigan gets one shot, Danu throws some rocks, and then his little stompy temper tantrum, boom, boom, boom. And the whole time, the ponies are just having a good old laugh, ha ha ha, what a fun game. Oh my god, how will our heroes ever win? But anyway, the hijinks are over, and Twilight and Danu go back to their conversation. And wow, Spike defeated Belor all by himself. And I really do love how this quote-unquote twist is handled. It's kind of like dramatic irony, but I guess it's not quite. It's like hybrid foreshadowing as well. Because I guess, like, if you're not really thinking about it, you might not think that Caradwin disguised Ballora as Spike. <laughs> but I mean, there's literally no way Spike could take on Ballora by himself. And then the big reveal and Spike comes up and Ballora transforms back. This is such a good way to transition to the endgame. I really like this. And then, boom, Canterlot is destroyed. Every pony's preparing for death when all of a sudden, the birds come in and telekinesis some rocks. And then the dogs come and telekinesis some rocks. And then the zebras, the abata, and the kelpies come. And they don't use the elements of harmony, they just use their regular magic. They, they just do their own thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then the cats come and do the exact same thing. No elements required. <laughs> yeah, you know what? You don't need the elements all the time. Good job, Capper. Also, while we're here, Shadow, the cat, is drawn incorrectly. She was not given her cool new magic -y ears. Rip. Also, Chummer's naked, and it's a little weird, but it's not that bad. Not as bad as when Capper gets naked. And then Donnie throws an even bigger fit. We will destroy you! And then, Gallus gets his wish. He gets to do a cool Elements of Harmony charge-up thing! Ah! And then, BAM! Danu is reverted back to his normal size, and I guess Twilight and the Stars will get their magic back, and BAM! The day is saved! The end. It's unfortunate there was barely any time for hype to build. You know, Dobby destroyed cancer a lot and things got really sad. And then reinforcements finally arrived and things started to look like, wow, we're gonna be okay. And then Donu's dead, we get three seconds of hype. <laughs> Feels bad. 
Also, for continuity's sake, I did update the moon to say Luna is a bitch. Previously, it incorrectly said Luna was here, which I mean, was what it used to say before Cosmos changed it into Luna is A. And I guess she could have changed the rocks back off screen, but I'd rather... <laughs> I think it's funnier if it just still says Luna is a B word. Alright, so issues 101 and 102. For now, I'm just going to judge them separately as their own little standalone story, like apart from the whole of season 10. Was it a good story? If you recall my <laughs> reaction from when I immediately finished it, <laughs> I said there was no story to be found. That's technically a little over-exaggerated, you know, I was in the moment, I was, it was hilarious. <laughs> All of the Knights of Harmony just got one shot and they ran away. You know, it was, it was really funny. But I mean, here's the really sad thing about issues 101 and 102. There is, there are several pieces of a story there that we didn't get told. It's like, it's like the writer decided on a pretty well thought out story. And then I guess scrapped at the last minute and just threw everything to a pile and said, the end, the Knights of Harmony get defeated. So I got a question for you guys. What are your thoughts on Danu? What do you think of his character and how he progressed throughout these two issues? And I mean, I'm not telling you to go and type in the comments. That was a rhetorical question. But I mean, I guess you could give me a rhetorical answer if you want. Anyway, I think Danu's character was handled very well. And how is that, you ask? All he does is go crazy and want to kill everyone? That's exactly it. I just think his character was written for a very different story. And there are several signs of this alternate story floating about. I'm proposing that this story was supposed to be about Twilight teaching the Knights of Harmony how to be friends with each other. Thinking back to what the Tree of History says, and yes, I'm bringing up the damn Tree of History again. <laughs> At their core, all of the elements of Harmony are about friendship, and all of Season 10 has been about repairing relationships. Zakora and all her friends, Jen and Katharina, Capper and Chummer, and Solano and Ossipi. And within issues 101 and 102, there are hints of this repeating theme. Even though the Knights of Harmony are supposed to be evenly led by three princes and three princesses, Danu has declared himself king. Not only does he not value their abilities or their character, he doesn't even value their element. On two occasions, your elements have some utility, and most importantly, loyalty. And it's this loyalty that he values so much, that is the crux of this story, or rather, the loss of loyalty. And I don't mean specifically his loyalty, I mean the corruption of the element of loyalty of patriotism over the last thousands of years. When Danu first arrives, his mission is quite straightforward, retrieve Equestria's elements, that is all. Following his ancestors' guidance, he is not here to attack the city or hurt any ponies. Even when Twilight's like, uh, yeah, we don't have any elements, our tree's way cooler than yours. And I mean, Equestria's tree is way cooler than the other five trees. I mean, I don't see their trees making a giant castle that also makes locked boxes that can also turn items into keys for that box that unleashes the power of Super Saiyan. Come on, our tree's fucking awesome! Man, I wish Star Soul said anything about the creation of the tree in this story. But anyway, even when Twilight says no, Danu's resolve doesn't change. His mission still is to acquire the magic of all elements of harmony. And he's truly disappointed in Twilight for not sacrificing her life for the lives of her citizens. Because now, Danu will be forced to fight Equestria's army. Just looking at these few scenes, Danu's loyalty and patriotism is apparent. And for the rest of issue 101, this is where Danu's character stays. It's not until the main man himself, Discord, appears that the story really starts rolling. Immediately upon seeing him, just something in Danu flips. He is no longer on a mission about loyalty or patriotism. He simply is here for revenge. And it's not entirely his fault. This is how he was raised. From the day we're born, we are trained to wield the power of the elements. And because our elements are tied to love of country, we are not at the whims of feelings. And I mean, it's right there. It's not just the rest of his set he doesn't respect, it's literally every single other element that isn't the loyalty of country. The Knights of Harmony 
or rather the Knights of Order, have all but become a corrupted shell of their former selves. I mean the Knights of Harmony the Collective, not these specific six characters. <laughs> a little confusing, I know. And this is used to foil Twilight. Her element of magic literally requires her acceptance of the rest of her set. If she doesn't embrace kindness, generosity, laughter, loyalty, and honesty, did I say them all? The element of magic doesn't even form. The spark ignited inside me when I realized that you all are my friends. Danu says the elements of patriotism are a shield used to protect their home. This statement is the reason Danu cannot win. Upon seeing Discord, he is no longer here to simply protect his home. If we stop these elements and let him escape, it will mean nothing. Raise the city if you have to. Destroy Equestria. And it's at this point, Tyrannus and Caradwin question him. Waterboy no longer accepts his command, and Morrigan loses faith in his ability to lead. And then there's Belor, who's who's just magic. So he's the only one truly not bound to the whims of feelings. I believe this is the one case where friendship is not magic. Unless Moon is actually still magic for some reason, then I guess this is the second case. And then, Danu commands the knights to split up. A nice reminder that they don't care about each other. Meanwhile, Equestria's elements are standing strong and are easily able to pick them off. And sadly, this is where this story ends. It doesn't progress any farther than this. There is no payoff. And it's like, what happened? Did it have to be scrapped for time constraints? Did they simply not know how to write the ending? Cause uh, the rest of the knights died, and then Danu just kept making earthquakes, and then he got one shot. Uh, how, how is this the end? <laughs> all of this, all of this build-up and character development. <laughs> how is this the end? All the rest of the knights had to do was walk up to Danu and be like, what the hell are you doing? This isn't patriotism. This is genocide. Whether or not Danu changes his mind is irrelevant. All that needed to be done is that the other five knights collectively disavow Danu's leadership. And again, as shown earlier, the other five knights are unified together, and Danu is the outlier. Blaming all of Equestria for Discord's actions violates Caridwin's element of equity. What pride does Tyrannus feel from this? This isn't what it means to be a Knight of Harmony. Morrigan and Waterboy? Their faith and acceptance of Danu is already gone. And then there's Belor, which... <laughs> this is... <laughs> this is also why I hate Moon being called magic. Because Equestria's magic isn't magic, it's friendship. They just, it's just called magic. What, what is Belor's actual... <laughs> What is Belor's actual element? I don't know, it's just magic. So, I guess Belor has no stake in this, he can do whatever the hell he wants. On a side tangent, speaking of element of magic, when, when Twilight said, no pony can sit this out, you know who actually sat this out and contains a portion of the element of magic's power? Sunset Shimmer. If only she got included in more things. And no matter how hard Twilight tries to show Danu the value of friendship, and how much she has tried to use the elements to change the world, she cannot change him. Danu believes that this is what loyalty to his home means. As a Knight of Harmony, he was taught that it was his responsibility to make sure the rest of the elements never became activated, and he is fulfilling that purpose the best he can. He has become so blinded by his loyalty that he completely hates the rest of the world. Anyone that is not of Kunabula is lesser to him. Even anyone who does not share his element of loyalty is lesser to him. And only the other five Knights of Harmony can open his eyes. And the problems with his story aren't because of Danu. The problem is, just like Danu, this story doesn't respect the other five Knights or their elements. They just get left to do minor background commentary and reaction, or get ran over by a yak. Ha ha ha, so funny. Oh look, wow, Discord killed Tyrannus off screen. Man, don't you just love these other five Knights of Harmony? I think that sums up my problems with 101 and 102. But I gotta say, I do think the quality of dialogue between Twilight and Donnie was pretty good. 
even if it did overstay its welcome a touch too much, it really is like 60% of the story just them talking. And I mean, that, that itself reflects my problems with season 10 as a whole. There was a lot of not anything important going on. And I mean, truly, there were only four issues that talk about the main plots. The finale of Zakora 92, 100, 101, and 102. With 100 being 90% exposition, and 102 just using Danu to try to rationalize why any of this actually mattered. Whatever happened during development, something went wrong, they did not have the time they needed for this story. And it shows. Zakora's arc started off pretty good, with the exception of Part 3, which benefited neither Zakora's subplot or the overarching plots. And in the moment, it didn't feel bad that they were spending so much time developing Zakora's friends. But in the long run, it was worthless because they never came up again and they didn't matter. it didn't matter who they were. And this is shown in the Diamond Dog arc. We literally don't know anything about these damn dogs. <laughs> we didn't explore the characters, and we didn't explore the main plot. What was the purpose of Team Rarity's story? They're just assigned some elements that don't make any sense. Which, I wonder what their elements actually are. Like, man, yeah. I do like that all the other sets of elements are different elements in themselves. But I wish this concept was introduced earlier in the story, rather than right at the very end with the last set of elements. And then there's Capra's arc, which, gotta say, I really liked this story. That being said, it didn't matter that they had a Tree of Harmony. Other than it's simply existing, this story has zero connection to the main plot. So I gotta wonder, what did every land having a Tree of Harmony actually do for this story? Because at its core, it seems like nothing important. For whatever reason, they couldn't decide whether to focus on the Tree of Harmony or the individual problems within the other lands. So instead, they split the difference, and the story suffered for it. Alright, do I have anything more to say? Cadence and Discord were poorly utilized in this story. I wish they were both used better. I wish Discord was used at all. <laughs> this story supposedly is about Discord. Why didn't he say anything? How did he have zero dialogue relevant to this plot? Why was he even here at all? Well, I mean, Discord was here simply to trigger Danu. <laughs> that was his- that was his role in this story. Uh, I don't- I'm not gonna get into how weird it is that Discord's even blamed for this. It truly doesn't make a lot of sense that he's just there, and then why he goes out of his way to the zebras and the dogs and the cats, but don't hit up the burrs while he's at it. I truly think this wasn't supposed to be Discord's fault, and that there was indeed more to this tale, but much like the rest of the story, got left out to rot. I know I said I wasn't gonna get into it, but I guess I got into it a little bit. It also triggers me a little that there's like 17 references to Cosmos. <laughs> even though this has nothing to do with her, which at its core feels like it should. It would have been a reasonable explanation for how this was Discord's fault. The Cosmos quote-unquote reference that I'm most interested in is this one right here. And sure, Cosmos isn't here, but look at those six characters on the left. That's Team Cosmos right there. The guys who took her down. And the way this little image is framed makes it seem like some sort of memory Donu is having. Some story he was told. But why is Team Cosmos fighting the Knights of Harmony? That doesn't make sense. I thought the Knights arrived multiple thousands of years ago. <laughs> That's the problem. Nothing makes sense in this story. Also, why are the Knights of Harmony chimeral creatures? Why are they named after gods and goddesses? It really feels like they should have a deeper connection to Discord and Cosmos. I guess I could talk about Cadence a little bit. You know, for the Princess of Love, she sure did have nothing to talk about when it came to the love of country. I bet Cadence could have talked some sense into the other Five Knights of Harmony, give him a little love speech. But I guess the, she was just brought in to be a joke, I don't know why. <laughs> That's one thing Cadence really doesn't need. Um, and I guess on the same lines, I wish Star Squirrel had a little more to say about Equestria's tree, considering it seems to be, um, very relevant to the plot, but I guess, and eh, not important. And... 
I think I just have one more itty bitty tiny problem. And it's just an art direction thing. It's this scene right here. It's just a bad portrayal of Pinkie Pie. Canterlot kinda just got obliterated, and um, I don't think this is the time to be making jokes. Sorry, nothing about this is funny to me. Anyway, is... is that it? I guess so. So, those are my thoughts on Season 10. Let me know what you guys think in the comments, and until next time...